Hello, this is Scott Horton with Horton Law. I will be presenting today's webinar on the law of telecommuting. We are scheduled to get started in just a couple of minutes, so I just wanted to say hello and then wait and let everyone join the room and be back with you in just a couple of minutes to get started with today's presentation. Hello and welcome as you join the room. You should have access to a chat window where you'll be able to ask questions. You should see the cover slide for today's presentation, The Law of Telecommuting. And um, this is Scott Horton. I will be presenting today's webinar. We are scheduled to get started in just a minute or two. We will allow um, more folks to join the room. And once it looks like people have had that opportunity, I will be back in just a minute to get started. Welcome to those who are joining the presentation. You should see the cover slide, the law of telecommuting on your screen. There should also be a chat window. That's where you'll be able to ask questions, which I will answer primarily at the end of the presentation. We are still having people join the room, so I'm going to give another minute or two for everyone to get here, and then we will get started. This is Scott Horton. Thanks to uh, those of you who just joined us for participating today. We are still having people come into the room, so I'm going to wait a few more um, seconds at least, maybe a minute or two, and let that continue to happen. And then we will get started with today's presentation on the law of telecommuting. You should have the cover slide for answering some questions primarily at the end, but don't wait until the end of the presentation to type your questions into the chat window. Um, go ahead and say hi if you are here, appreciate it. Hello to all of you. Um, again, ask questions as you have them, but understand that I will most of the time wait until the end of the presentation to answer questions, but I don't want you to forget the questions as we go. So again, today's topic is the law of telecommuting, what employers must know to make it work. I'm Scott Horton, attorney and founder of Horton Law, PLLC. I practice primarily labor and employment law, representing business organizations, that is employers, primarily in and around New York State, but some of my clients do have employees in other states. So this presentation will mention some New York specific issues, but is presented um, as a general nature, and I will also make some references for what happens if you have employees in multiple states, which could be um, the case, especially given the, the topic and the telecommuting issue, because if you have employees who are telecommuting, you're not necessarily limited um, by state or geographic restrictions. So here's a quick overview of what we'll be discussing, and we will go about an hour, including the question and answer, but I will stay on to answer as many questions as I can. So we'll talk briefly about what telecommuting is and distinguish some um, related concepts like telework and homework uh, and those types of things from telecommuting specifically. That being said, there'll be a lot of lap uh, overlap in the legal issues and concerns that I'm talking about as to 
how they apply to telecommuting and other closely related, although distinguishable um, work arrangements. So that will be the bulk of our presentation. Then the legal concerns aspect, we're gonna go through about eight broad topics, um, eight topics broadly speaking, in which I'll note some finer points under each. And then we will wrap up with some discussion of telecommuting policies and agreements. So some things you may want to have in place if you do have employees who are telecommuting. So broadly speaking, then telecommuting is defined as the substitution of technology for commuter travel. In other words, rather than relying on a car or public transportation to travel from one's residence to a workplace, office, or facility run by their employer, people are able to forego the travel working at home using phones, laptops, computers, um, tablets, other technology that is readily available these days. Um, often to work at home, but potentially, you know, in a coffee shop or something else like that. There are some other topics as I alluded to, such as telework, which is even broader than telecommuting, where you're working through technology and not in the um, company work space per se, but that includes situations, for example, where employees regularly work um, in an office, for example, and then go home at the end of the day, take work with them that they complete at home and bring back with them. For example, um, while obviously some of the issues that we're discussing about telecommuting um, apply in that situation as well, you know, that, that there's still a situation where the employee is generally reporting to work and um, ha has oversight through most of their workday, or at least is physically available. So telecommuting, as we're going to be discussing it, generally means the bulk of the time the employee is not in the workplace, although um, obviously most employees come into their employer's premises at, at some points. We're also not talking today specifically about um, you know, outside sales representatives or something like that, where they report into the office to get their assignments for the day and then go out and make sales calls on potential customers. Again, some of these issues may apply, but there they're not foregoing the commute into the workplace by using technology to work from home. They're just doing the same types of work they'd always done by and large, um, separate and apart from technology, where they just don't happen to be on site all the time. I mean, for example, uh, landscaping employees who go out on crews and perform landscaping um, for various homeowners or businesses would not generally be thought of as telecommuters just because they're not working physically in property owned or controlled by their employer. So I just wanna ask a Quick question, how many of you are in organizations who have employees who telecommute regularly now? So if you don't mind taking a look at that uh, poll question and putting in an answer. My organization does. I have employees who telecommute working for me and my law firm. It's fairly common, as I'm going to discuss in just a minute. And so far, everyone on here says they do have employees who telecommute. So perhaps that's not surprising, and perhaps that's why you are interested in this topic. Okay, so moving on, before we get into the legal concerns and considerations, I just wanted to note that uh, based on studies showing data from the past uh, not not the past probably two years, but I think the study goes into 2017 and relies even more on data from 2015 and 16, so they've had enough time to process it. The uh, data show that it's actually more common to find telecommuting among older employees, employees who are 35 years old or older, and among the various defined generations in the workforce these days, of which of course there are several, um, there's actually a higher proportion of baby boomers 
telecommuting than other generations, including the millennials who are more likely to actually report to work. So that might be surprising for some. Um, but it's not surprising in the sense that telecommuting actually enables um, older workers to continue in the workforce longer than they might otherwise be able to, whether it be for mobility or family or, or other life reasons, that they are able to work, whether it be part-time or full-time from home, even though they would not be able to or would choose not to report to a separate workplace. Telecommuting has continued to grow steadily over the past decade. There's not been a major spike overall, although probably in some industries it has become more prevalent. It's also not limited to um, traditional office information types of industries. There are a lot of manufacturing jobs in uh, the telecommuting world, whether that be the, the physical act of manufacturing, probably less so, but other related components, whether it be buying or sales or um, engineering, for example, that relate to the business of a manufacturer. Telecommuters earn $4,000 more annually than non-telecommuters on average. And, and this is limited to workers earning under $100,000 per year. Per year, there are high, a lot of high earners, um, CEOs and stuff like that, that you wouldn't define as telecommuters that skew the statistics overall. But if you just look at workers earning under $100,000 per year, telecommuters earn more on average. Men and women are about equally likely to work remotely, a couple percentage point difference, nothing outside what you would expect in the population by and large. And workers with bachelor's degrees or higher are more likely to work from home than those with high school diplomas or associates degrees. Obviously, the majority of people with bachelor's degrees or higher degrees are still likely not to be permanent telecommuters, but um, there is a higher proportion of those people who telecommute than those with lower degrees or no, um, ha having not graduated from high school. And perhaps surprisingly, again, most telecommuters work more than 40 hours a week. So it's not limited to part-time employment. And for the most part, telecommuters are engaged in full-time employment. Now, it, it may be possible that some of these telecommuters are working 40 hours or more per week across multiple employers, but by and large, telecommuting has not risen just because people wanted part-time work that they could do from home. Before we get to the legal aspects and considerations, I just want to point out that, of course, there is a reality component to tele telecommuting. It's not going to work in every situation. Um, there are two primary questions to ask, notwithstanding all the legal complications that we're going to go into and risks. But the first question being, is it the right job where telecommuting is even a possibility? There's a picture here of a chef working in a restaurant. Um, and most often, you know, retail, you know, at least traditional in-person retail versus online retail is going to require customer service and um, the, the cooking types of jobs in restaurants to be done on site. That being said, you could have a situation where you have a chef who cooks food in his own home and sends it to the restaurant. Perhaps you have a, a home baker who supplies pies to your restaurant for dessert. Um, so there, there's no absolutes is really the point there. But as we'll get to later, um, there's probably higher risks associated with having an employee who cooks in their own home versus someone who just works on their computer. And then you have to consider even if the job is suitable for telecommuting, is the employee well um, suited for such a work, you know, arrangement? Um, here we have a picture of someone who, you know, hypothetically may be uh, supposed to be at work in her home office, but has decided to go outside and enjoy a nice day and feel the grass with her toes. I mean, obviously, it's 
equally possible that she's doing this on the weekend or in her own time. Um, so again, no absolute, but there are concerns about whether everyone would be able to work as productively without being on site for a number of reasons, either because they need the workplace atmosphere to motivate them, or they need more oversight than others, or they need to interact in person with teams of, of other employees and are either not able to do that as practically remotely or um, just don't enjoy communicating electronically as much as they do in person. So even if they could and would perform the job uh, sufficiently by telecommuting, they may enjoy the job better if they were actually at work, notwithstanding the need to travel from home to the office each day. And kind of with that said, I just want to throw up another quick poll and ask you whether you think more employees in your organization would like to telecommute if allowed to do so. Okay, so again, we have a pretty universal uh, response here that everyone believes that the employees in their organization overall would like to telecommute more if they were allowed to do so. Um, and again, these might be reasons why they're not allowed to do so, that the job doesn't really allow for it, or there's reason to be concerned whether the employee could succeed in that environment. Or, it could be that the organization is reluctant to allow them to telecommute for various reasons that ultimately either um, result from or relate to legal questions and concerns. So that's what we're going to speak about for the bulk of this presentation. As I said before, we'll then come back and wrap up with some comments about what types of documentation you may wanna have in place with respect to people who do telecommute um, in, in your organization. So one area that pretty logically comes into play with telecommuters relate to timekeeping or record keeping. As you know, under various state and federal laws, employers need to keep accurate time records for employees. This is especially true for employees eligible for overtime, where at a minimum you need to understand whether employees have worked over 40 hours in a week, for example, and without accurate time records, the organization can be held responsible for having not paid overtime and be at the same time in a position where they're not sure how much overtime, if any, the employee actually worked. Of course, this raises the question, can you trust telecommuters to report their time accurately? And the related question of can you provide a reliable mechanism for time keeping? You know, again, traditionally for hourly workers, at least workplaces have been able to have some form of time clock or time keeping system. The time clock by the door where someone physically puts the card in, gets a stamp, when they enter and then does the same thing when they leave is a fairly reliable, although not foolproof method of knowing when someone was at work. Then, you know, we moved into the various electronic means of tracking that, whether it be through your computer where you have to log in when you turn your computer on and log off when you can turn your computer off. Again, there's hardly any perfect systems or electronic systems where instead of punching a card, you scan your um, ID card or, or something when you enter or exit the building or when you go on or off duty, for example. I mean, all of those um, in-person mechanisms, you know, are capable of being manipulated. And I've dealt with plenty of cases over the years where employees have found ways of doing that by having someone else punch their card for them, or even if it's not intentional, commonly 
forgetting to sign in and out for lunch, for example, creating complications and questions about the accuracy of the timekeeping records. But when you have employees at home, of course, you would still need to keep track of their time in some respects, especially again, if they're eligible for overtime. I also um, had thought through the issue under the New York paid family leave um, program, the new laws that took effect this year. There's, there's two questions. One is based on who's eligible and when you become eligible, that's uh, whether you work 20 or more hours per week for which you would need records, uh, even if the person is somehow exempt despite working part-time, which is possible. Um, and with respect to tracking when someone, especially again, who works under 20 hours a week, would become eligible for paid family leave, that's based on the number of days that they have actually worked, not even the number of hours. So you would really need to know for a telecommuter and anyone else, not just how many hours did they work in a week, but actually how many days did they work. So really records down to the how many hours per day would probably be necessary to track that among other things. So there are ways to track this for people who hardly ever come into the office. Again, you can use computer mechanisms um, or you can rely on you know, self-reporting by the employee. But again, there's usually not a supervisor or other coworkers around to see what happens once the employee punches in through whatever means necessary and then punches out. So, you know, someone could go out to the lawn after logging into their computer, depending on the nature of their job. You may or may not be able to monitor digitally um, their activity. You know, who's to say every position actually requires somebody to be moving a mouse around and clicking. Some would not. It may be that you have physical documents to review and how, who's going to know how long it took you to review those if you're off-site. Again, these problems are true within the workplace as well, but at least you're more likely to have direct oversight. Not to say that any of these are reasons not to allow telecommuting, but they are issues to think about, issues to address in policies where applicable, and to um, monitor and manage from a supervisory standpoint. Don't forget, go ahead and type in questions if and when you have them, just so you don't forget. I will probably uh, hold questions until the end. If, however, I see a question that makes a lot of sense to answer where I am, then I won't hesitate to do that. We're gonna go about an hour, so um, keep that in mind, but I will stay on to answer questions at the end as, as they last. Okay, the next slide is meal periods. And in New York, where probably all of you have at least some employees or your organization has some employees, there are state laws that impose mandatory meal period breaks, which are based on hours worked in a day and the timing of the start and finish time of the employee's schedule, that type of thing. Um, other states have Similar laws, if you have employees elsewhere, the laws may vary. There are certainly some states that don't have meal period requirements. But again, at least in New York and in a number of other states, um, you know, all employees have a right to meal periods. In New York, for example, this includes exempt employees. So that, again, creates another sort of record keeping question. Um, may already create it for most of the exempt employees within your work uh, space who actually physically report. But again, for the telecommuters, even if you were thinking you'd get away with not having records for time because the telecommuter is exempt, um, you may get away with it, but there is still the possibility of that person not taking their meal period. And this is not something, at least in New York, that can be waived. So if for some reason the Department of Labor came in and had reason to question whether employees were taking meal breaks, including telecommuting employees in some cases, then um, there could be a violation found in that regard. But again, there's no carve out or exception generally for telecommuters. But again, it's based on how long is the shift as to whether and when and how often these breaks are required. 
related under the Fair Labor Standards Act, the federal law that applies to most, if not essentially all workers in the United States, there are um, interpretations that say employees who are taking breaks of less than 50 or 15 minutes or less um, can't be required to go off the clock for that time. In other words, you can't require someone to take an unpaid break of 10 minutes during their workday. So that's a, something else that could possibly be a logistical um, record keeping issue um, and at least a, a question that's hard to monitor one way or the other um, remotely as it is in itself already enough of a problem to monitor within the workplace. So it's just something to keep in mind. Are you able not just to track the total hours that employees are working at home, but to somehow sufficiently monitor whether they're taking time off properly within their home workday? Uh, the, the big issue, probably the most uh, costly legal compliance concern in this area would be with respect to overtime. A couple different facets of this. First, most employers restrict overtime in certain ways to contain costs. So just because somebody works at home, you don't necessarily want them to think they can work 70 hours a week um, because that in the case of non-exempt employees would result in at least 30 hours of overtime pay at time and a half. So make sure that, that the expectations there are clearly communicated. But then the next question becomes, well, what happens if overtime is appropriate? What's the mechanism to get approval for overtime? In the workplace, it might be as easy as saying to the boss who's in the office next door, I need to stay after for an hour, is that okay? And they say yes. I mean, in most cases, now it's easy enough to communicate electronically in real time um, between employees in their home workspaces and the supervisors within the, the building or who may be re working remotely themselves. But at least there still has to be consideration and process for that. Then as I said, you know, non-exempt employees, even if they're telecommuting, would be entitled to overtime, usually after 40 hours work in a work week. Going back to the question of, are you tracking the hours carefully enough? And are employees reporting all the hours worked? Because you might have employees who, for whatever reason, feel maybe they've been told they can't work overtime, but they feel they need to get the job done or don't want to look bad because they weren't able to get the job done in the time allowed. So they might be reporting that they worked 40 hours or less when in reality they actually spent more than 40 hours doing their job. Like many of these other things, it could be a problem within the workplace as well, but is exacerbated by the fact that employees would be working from home or wherever and there's no one to see, well, I see that you um, put down that you worked 40 hours last week, but it seemed like you were in the office, you know, all hours every day, harder to track, although still possible in ways remotely based on their activity on electronic um, documentation and communication platforms, et cetera. But in some cases, you may not know where employees are under-reporting their hours work, which on the front end doesn't necessarily look like a bad financial problem for the organization, but on the back end, if that employee becomes disgruntled and later says they worked a bunch of hours off the clock, the employer is not going to get off the hook by saying they underreported their hours. The employee is still entitled to compensation, overtime compensation and minimum wage compensation at the least for all hours worked, even if they didn't. Uh, report the time worked. If there's any way that the company should have known that they were working, for example, based on the volume of work that they're getting done in the time that they're saying they're doing it. Still on the category of time, broadly speaking, um, generally, as we've said, it's more difficult to monitor time for 
employees working remotely. Likewise, it's more difficult to monitor time off when employees do not have to actually report to a workplace um, where other employees or supervisors or, are present. In other words, um, you know, you tell your supervisor that you're working and you might not be working or you tell somebody that you are off sick and nonetheless you're actually doing some work at home. Again, not clear that the latter situation is always bad for the organization. Uh, you know, okay, so someone can't come into work, so they're going to work at home. Um, that might be perfectly acceptable in some cases. Someone who doesn't normally come into work anyway and works from home reports that they're sick and wants to take a sick day um, and you say okay but nonetheless does some work at home during that day might be fine but it can become complicated in monitoring your vacation and sick leave pto whatever it might be um, benefits for example in the case of exempt employees you can only dock employees for sick days that are part and parcel to a bona fide sick leave policy. And if people are taking sick days when they're actually working part of the day, that might be a obstacle to maintaining the salary basis requirement of some of the overtime exemptions. Now, you might reasonably ask what's the likelihood of that ever coming to light or creating a problem leading to litigation or causing liability for the organization. I can't answer that question other than to say that if it does, the liability could be significant, especially if it's spread across a large category of employees who are then entitled to overtime at time and a half some portion of their salary over the number of hours that they later claim that they worked and can't be rebutted because the company didn't maintain time record for those employees. So you, special, you should definitely give consideration to how can you accurately track benefit time and hours worked for telecommuting employees in the first place and then i wanted to point out the additional concern related to the family and medical leave act this doesn't necessarily apply to all of you who are listening to this webinar fmla leave is available to some employers in um, organization some employees in organizations where their employer has at least 50 employees among other um, requirements. So anything under 50 employees and you're not subject to the FMLA. However, in New York, you would still be subject to the paid family leave requirements. And in either case, if someone is eligible for, qualifies for and elects to take that leave, then they cannot be required to work even from home. And at the extreme, this means that although the person has company issued smartphones, tablets, laptops, etc., cetera, um, you can't require them to even monitor company related email or respond or theoretically even take a phone call. Now, most employees are not going to object to incidental cases, but first of all, know that if they do that and they're protected by these statutes to take that time off, they can't be required to work at home. The other reminder is that just because someone telecommutes, they could still be eligible for FMLA. However, it does get interesting because one of the other requirements to be eligible for FMLA is that you work within um, a 75 mile radius of 50 or more employees. So if you are based in New York and have an employee in say even Ohio, um, you know, it's unlikely that unless you have other employees working in Ohio, that that person would qualify or be eligible for FMLA leave because they're not within a 75 mile radius of your other employees. So that's not discriminating against anyone within the organization, that's just following the FMLA. On the other hand, if you do 
on some occasion extend to benefits like FMLA to even calling it FMLA to employees who did not meet the 50 employees within a 75 mile radius, then you know you might create a scenario where if you suddenly were to deny that to somebody, um, you could be uh, facing a discrimination claim. The other point of note is that while I noted the case where somebody works in Ohio and the company is in New York, there's also an initial question of what is that person's workplace. So they might be able to argue that they go into the um, New York office often enough and report to people there such that that is actually their workplace, not working from home. Um, and those are sort of fact specific cases, but I just wanted to point that out as a possibility before you jump to conclusions. Sorry, I got one slide ahead there, but um, so we're moving right along. There are a lot of issues that we're touching on here. The next one being uh, somewhat related to FMLA considerations, at least in some respects, and that is the question of disability accommodations. Under the Americans with Disability Act and similar state laws, such as the New York Human Rights Law, employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations to qualified employees with disabilities. If you have any experience in human resources or employment law, then it's likely that you have come across questions of disability accommodation, and you may know that what constitutes a reasonable accommodation always depends on the specific circumstances. So there are no bright line rules on to what's reasonable and what is not. That pertains as well to various issues with respect to telecommuting. In the first instance, employees who regularly do telecommute may have right to be accommodated within their home workplace. For example, in the traditional setting, there might be questions of whether you need to make physical changes to your office to accommodate uh, an individual with a disability, whether that be you know, some form of ramp or changes to access to restrooms or even office areas where you know, walkways might need to be expanded or modified, railings added, that type of thing. Um, the question could arise as to whether the employer is obligated to make physical modifications to the employee's own home to enable them to perform their job. The, the complication with respect to the ADA and the other laws that talk about reasonable accommodations, not only do you have to figure out what's a reasonable accommodation, but you also have to consider whether a reasonable accommodation, even if, if it exists, would pose an undue hardship on the employer organization. Undue hardship doesn't always mean, but often means how much is it going to cost and is that cost reasonable? Um, likely, uh, you know, a judge or the EEOC or the Division of Human Rights or some other um, state agency that is considering the question would find that making a physical modification to the employer owned or controlled premises would be less of a burden than doing it to someone's own private residence. But again, it could depend on the circumstances. If you're doing it to your um, own owned or controlled property, then you know you have additional benefits of having that change available for other employees, whether it be people that are currently working there or to have them working for you in the future. Whereas if it's the person's home, if they no longer work for you, then you're not necessarily going to go in and remove the physical modification, depending on what it is. On the other hand, something like uh, a standing desk that, or, you know, a riser on a desk that would enable someone to accommodate a disability in their home is not 
unlike an accommodation that would be made in the workplace. So might be something that would be deemed both reasonable and not an undue hardship in some cases, depending on the circumstances. With respect to reasonable accommodations and the costs involved, it's often fair to consider the size and wherewithal of the employer organization as well. So the smallest of companies would reach the level of undue hardship faster than larger companies with more significant bank accounts. So that's the issue or the, you know, the gist of issues facing employees who regularly telecommute. The flip side question is whether telecommuting itself is or could be a reasonable accommodation. Uh, the EEOC certainly takes the position that it can be and they have guidance for telework on their um, website that's some years old now, but there is guidance available from the EEOC on the question. Relatively few courts have addressed the so-called telecommute dispute, but some of the ones that have, uh, have ruled that allowing an employee to telecommute can be a reasonable accommodation and in some cases have found it not to impose an undue hardship on the employer. Again, you'd have to look at the totality of the circumstances. Some courts have, have held in specific cases that allowing an employee to telecommute would be either unreasonable or an undue hardship. Important factors include whether the same or other employees have generally been allowed to telecommute or telework in some respect in the past. You know, there's cases where there was a dispute over whether the employer had to allow an employee to telecommute as a reasonable accommodation. And the employer claimed that it was unreasonable and an undue hardship and that the person wouldn't be as successful in the job while telecommuting but throughout the time that the litigation was pending, the employer continued to employ the individual and allow them to telecommute during which time they were able to do their job successfully, demonstrating to the court that it was not unreasonable um, to allow them to telecommute as an accommodation. Obviously there can be discrimination issues with respect to employees with disabilities, whether you do or don't allow such employees to telecommute um, could in some cases raise disability discrimination claims. There is also the possibility of discrimination with respect to telecommuting along all of the various other protected characteristics as well. So to the extent possible and recognizing pertinent non-discriminatory distinctions, employers should be consistent in permitting employees to telecommute. You know, the, the ultimate um, form of consistency would be unilaterally saying we do not allow telecommuting or conversely, anyone who wants to can telecommute. The feasibility of either of those absolute depends significantly on the nature of the work and the various um, positions that an organization has. Um, and increasingly, especially for larger organizations, both of those positions are likely to become untenable. The um, reality is, however, that inconsistent treatment barring the absolute positions, even if inadvertent or well-intended, could lead to discrimination claims. One relatively plausible, um, but you know, by the same token, um, perhaps too stereotypical example would be a company that allows women with young children to work from home, but not male employees, whether that be male employees with young children or male employees generally would depend on the, the circumstances. But if, for example, a company only allowed people to telecommute if they had employee or, you know, children under the age of one, for example, uh, 
um, almost certainly that same opportunity should be extended both to men and women. Not to say there can't be in that situation disability related considerations where women might have disabilities resulting from pregnancy, childbirth that would entitle them to reasonable accommodations that wouldn't entitle male employees to accommodations just by virtue of the fact that their spouse had the child. Of course, this could overlap with FMLA issues, as I mentioned before, as to when and whether you can require employees to work during leave. Um, and you know, this only scratches the surface of the possible forms of discrimination related to telecommuting, but there are some that they are some that employers should keep in mind. Turning um, to a somewhat different area of legal concern related to telecommuting is the issue of confidentiality. Obviously, again, this is an issue like most of the others that applies within the physical workplace as well. But there is the reality that telecommuters, like other employees, often have access to confidential information and perhaps like other employees or perhaps beyond what other employees have. Um, the telecommuters have remote access to this information. Just real quick, the, there's a question about is this being recorded? Yes, if you're here now and you've signed up for this, if you registered for this webinar, you will get a link by tomorrow to the recording to this presentation. And the slides for the presentation will also be available. I'll put a link up to that at the end as we um, go into the question and answers. Sorry if I didn't mention both those things earlier. So with respect again to these telecommuters who have remote access to company information, they also have less direct supervision over their use of company data and property. So that, you know, raises the concern of what are they doing as they sit on their computer at home and access confidential information. Could they copy it? Um, many ways that they could copy it, many ways that they could copy it if they were sitting at a desk in the office as well. But again, you don't have other people around that would make it potentially more difficult to misappropriate information. So you should all be thinking about what measures do you take to prevent employees from intentionally or even accidentally taking or transferring proprietary information um, for their own use or to unauthorized third parties. Not to leave that thought entirely, but to raise a related one that, you know, security, of course, is also a question. There are, even if you have good employees who are telecommuting, like in the workplace, there are outside parties who may have bad intentions and are seeking to access your business information. Remote data transfer between telecommuting employees and the company's electronic systems may not be as secure as on-site access. Obviously, there is a tremendous amount that can be done to ensure higher levels of security, but A, many companies are not taking those measures either based on cost or lack of awareness of the concerns or you know, carelessness or whatever the factors might be. Um, but that is a reality that someone who has access once they leave the workplace, I mean, frankly, you know, even employees who don't regularly telecommute but can log in from home um, raise these considerations. And, you know, the, there are these additional concerns when employees use public or home Wi Fi connections. Another thought, I think I mentioned at the beginning that telecommuters often work from home, sometimes work from coffee shops or wherever they can get Wi-Fi access or, you know, maybe they don't even need internet access. But, you know, even if you do a lot to lock down a home connection for your telecommuting employees, wonder whether they are and whether you've told them not to or whether you've allowed them to work at in the public and use public um, Wi-Fi connections, in which case the security risks are almost necessarily much greater. Again, there's ways to address that. I mean, there are 
you know, private hotspot type of uh, networks that companies can provide to employees, even if they're going to work outside of their home, transportable, you know, Wi-Fi connections that they can do more to lock down than what you would find at your local coffee shop. You know, whether that's cost effective or practical under the circumstances would have to be considered. And let's not forget just the physical um, security risk, the notion of break-in. I mean, your offices, especially to the extent you have confidential information held within them, probably have physical security means in place, whether it be locked cabinets, locked doors, alarm systems, on-site security, etc. cetera. Um, these are many things that your employee's home may not have by default. Again, you know, this may or may not matter as much. It may be that you're only concerned about the electronic transmission of data for your telecommuting employees. And once you address that, you have substantially resolved your um, risk of losing company property. It could be, however, that you have employees who are taking home physical files that, you know, would not be as well protected as they will be in the workplace. Uh, they may even have access to company property. Let's just think about the computer that you may be providing to your telecommuting employees. You know, in the case of a computer programmer or uh, some sort of digital graphics designer or something like that, you may be providing relatively expensive equipment even to telecommuting employees. Um, so question whether you want to require them to maintain some minimum level of physical security. Do you want to make sure they have an alarm system or ask them to somehow lock and secure access to that equipment? Of course, with respect to physical security risk, we also want to make sure that the employees themselves are safe. Under OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Act, at least private employers in the United States have obligations to keep their employees' workplace reasonably safe and secure. And it is possible that these, well, they, these responsibilities do extend to home workplaces as long as the employee, employer knows and allows the employee to be working from home. If there is a work-related accident in that space, it would probably trigger um, record keeping requirements at the least. And if the employee becomes injured, it could trigger a worker's compensation claim, even though the injury occurred in the employee's own home. Um, there have been a lot of questions about whether employers should inspect their telecommuting employees' home workspaces. By and large, OSHA and the federal government, at least, have come down on the position that it's not an expectation that employers inspect their employees' home workspaces, but through your workers' compensation carrier or just out of other concerns, it may be something that your company decides would be a good idea. And if, for example, there is a workers' comp claim and the employee is injured somehow at home in the course of performing their job, I mean, especially if there would have been some company property involved, uh, you know, to not get too extreme with it. If the um, employee develops work or carpal tunnel just through working at home on their home computer, um, you know, there may be need for the workers' comp carrier or the employer itself to inspect the work site and go into the home and look at the setup that the employee is using. Um, and even before that claim arises, it might be a good idea in some cases for employers to be um, at least getting pictures from their employees of their home work setups to you know, make recommendations as to modify it so that they don't get repetitive stress conditions among other things and beyond the safety and security risks. Um, there might be reasons why employers want to have eyes on their employees' home workspaces to you know, facilitate productivity and ensure that they are able to do the work that they are expected to do. Finally, on this slide, I note that 
um, there could even be questions as to whether the employer would become liable for injuries to third parties occurring in the employee's home workspace. Um, you know, many of your telecommuting employees would not be interacting with people in the course of their jobs within their own homes, other than to the extent they're doing it electronically, in which case any liability wouldn't be much different than if they were um, at work for the most part. But if you know you do have clients who are having customers or other employees meet with them in their homes and they um, slip and fall and become injured, at, at best there might become a dispute between the employees, homeowners or renters insurance, assuming they actually have it and your general liability um, coverage, for example, um, of, of the organization. Um, or, you know, it might just be clear to the extent that there's any coverage or it is or isn't an insurance issue, there could be responsibility on the organization's behalf. We're close to wrapping up. We're, after this slide, we'll move to some ideas about telecommunications policies and uh, agreements. This is a good time to type in any questions you have so we can get to those, but we're pretty much right on schedule. And again, I'll take questions and be happy to stay on past the hour to get them answered. But I did just want to also note that there are, of course, some workforces that are unionized in, in full or in part, and that there's no reason that employees who work from home can't be represented by unions as a general matter. Just because their job's not within the workplace, they could still be in a collective bargaining unit. Uh, unions themselves, from my experience and understanding, vary in their approach to this concept. Uh, let's suppose you had a, have a union that represents employees and there's never been any telecommuting, but then there's reason to have some employees within the bargaining unit be allowed to telecommute. I mean, that may well be a subject of bargaining in some respect with the union. Unions may universally reject the notion or they may want everyone to have that opportunity. Um, you know, just something to keep in mind. There's also the question of a new union coming in who seeks to represent employees, some of whom already telecommute, and that would raise various practical issues as to to what extent the terms and conditions of their employment with respect to their home workspaces would be subject to negotiation or could be addressed by employers feasibly in the first place. But by the same token, if the employer in that situation then called all the telecommuting employees back into the office, that might be deemed retaliation with respect to the organ union organizing efforts. So, you know, just some hypothetical possible concerns, things that actually do happen out there and just not to ignore if for some reason your organization uh, gets in that situation. All right, with all of those concerns raised, you know, and, and having already said that I personally in my um, firm have employees who telecommute, I should just note that the goal of this presentation is not to tell everyone never to um, have telecommuting employees. Certainly a viable um, option and alternative for some employees and for some jobs. And the point of this presentation is to say first, you know, among other things, when you can think through whether you can overcome some of these obstacles or enough of these obstacles to allow it. Also to point out, I think I have some scenarios where Arguably, you might be required to allow telecommuting, even if you otherwise would prefer not to, in which case you can't just say, well, I didn't want to do this in the first place, but somebody told me I had to. Um, so I shouldn't be responsible for all the other legal issues that are problematic. Um, none of these laws are going to drop by the wayside just because um, you're accommodating a employee's disability or the union has negotiated for the right for certain employees to telecommute. But if, if telecommuting is a significant part of your organization or even a minor part of a significant organization, I suppose you probably want to have some form of documentation about the expectations of telecommuting. 
in some cases, it would be advisable to have a general telecommuting policy as well as telecommuting agreements with individual employees who work in that arrangement. So in your telecommute, telecommuting policy, you would want to explain what telecommuting means in your organization. Again, there may be different expectations for people who just sometimes work after hours at home versus people who are regularly assigned to work from their home workspace or otherwise remotely. Who is eligible to telecommute? Is it only exempt employees? So you try to avoid the overtime questions. If that's the case, be careful. It's possible you could be systematically discriminating against some categories of employees based on protected characteristics. Those claims aren't prevalent these days, but again, you know, at least theoretically possible. Um, but whatever the lines you're going to draw, you should, you know, think them through well enough up front to try to avoid having to make ad hoc case by case decisions on whether an individual employee and their position is allowed to telecommute, may, perhaps allowing for exceptions based on disability accommodation, or perhaps not. What is the procedure for approving telecommuting arrangements? If someone's not specifically hired into a telecommuting type position up front, when can they ask to be moved into one and how do they do that? You should note, among other things, that telecommuting is generally a privilege and not a right. So it's the company's prerogative to make changes and require people to move back into the workforce. Again, re recognizing that there might be circumstances where there could be legal problems and impediments to doing that, but by and large, assume there wouldn't be and retain that right to the extent the law allows it. Certainly, telecommuters should be held to the same performance standards of similarly situated employees. I mean, it may be that everybody in a certain job position telecommutes, in which case they should all be held to a uh, high enough standard that it's worth employing them. And retain the right to monitor and inspect the workplace. Like I said, in some cases, this will mean physically making an inspection or just requiring employees to submit photographs or even video of their home workspace at, at intervals, for example, um, or if, if not that as a upfront matter, at least having the right to go in just in case for some reason something has gone wrong in the homework space. Just then real quick to wrap up before I answer the questions, um, a telecommuting agreement, you know, as a sort of subsidiary of your general telecommuting policy, you could have an agreement with the individual telecommuting employees that would restate many of the pertinent aspects of the telecommuting policy, and then specifically outline that individual employee's responsibilities as a commuter, recognizing that different positions might have different responsibilities as far as time worked, expectations, what equipment they're going to use, et cetera. Um, also address the supervisor's responsibilities as both what the employee has to report to the supervisor and how the supervisor is going to interact with the employee as a general matter. This goes right into the next point about the communication expectations. I mean, is the employee just expected to work and then maybe one day we'll find out what they've been doing or do they need to call in on a regular basis? Is there software that they need to update, et cetera? Schedule and reporting requirements, of course, be clear about that. Does the person have to come into work, into the office once a week, month, whatever? Um, are they expected to always work nine to five Monday through Friday, or do they just need to complete X number of hours over a work period? And, uh, you know, address whatever you need to as far as equipment, meaning, you know, either you're using your own computer, but have to install all this software and you can't let anybody else use your computer once you start using it working for us, or here's a computer that you can only use for business purposes. Obviously, same goes for smartphones, tablets. If you have mobile hotspots, you may in some cases be um, actually paying for employees' home internet usage. So then what restrictions do you place on that for non-business um, use? Just various things you need to think through depending on what you're doing as an organizational um, business 
matter. There are a couple questions. Go ahead and put those in now and make the slides available too for your future reference. Remember, you'll get a copy uh, or you'll get a link to the recording of the webinar if you need to watch it again or certainly feel free to share it with others that might benefit within or outside your organization. Um, just a reminder for those of you who uh, don't already know, I did publish a book earlier this year specific to New York employment law. It's available on Amazon. This is a copy of the cover if you're interested, relatively affordable, including especially if you just want the ebook version. Um, covers a lot of topics related to employment law specific to the man, uh, to the New York um, perspective. So if you have employees that you manage or oversee in New York, this is a good, um, easy to use, ready reference, whether you have it in ebook format or sitting in uh, relatively manageable paperback size on your desk. There's at least one or two questions. I'm going to answer those in just a minute, but as promised, I'm going to go ahead and put up the link to the slides for those of you who want to have access to those. And then I'm going to go back to the questions. Um, question, how would workers' compensation be uh, corroborated with the employee's home homeowner's insurance, which would take precedence? Um, most likely, if the, if the employee telecommuting for your organization suffered an injury in their home workspace that was in the course of their employment, then workers' compensation would take precedent and um, provide whatever benefits that it provides to the extent that there is damage to the employee's home or something like that, then workers' compensation would not um, traditionally cover that. There possibly the homeowner's insurance would or the employer's general liability policy might cover it if, for example, the computer that the company provided caught on fire and um, not only burned the employee, but destroyed, you know, their nice desk that they had in their home. Um, you know, the company might become liable for that one way or the other. Um, of course, if there's some injury to a third party that's not an employee, then there wouldn't be any workers' compensation. Um, available but again somebody else's and some other insurance policy whether it be the homeowners or the employer's general liability coverage for example might be responsible for such injuries or either party could potentially be personally responsible um, for the most part it would depend on what happened and whether it was actually related to the job right I, I guess I would imagine a scenario where an employee has some friends over, not while they're working, and their work provided computer happens to be sitting on the floor, and the friend, one of their friends, trips over that that laptop, for example, and you know injures themselves enough to where they you know have to go to the hospital and have some lasting injuries or whatever. You know, I think it'd be at least a, a question whether the employer is at all responsible for that because the employee happened to leave their work computer sitting on the floor. Um, but again, if, if there were a fire caused by equipment that the company provided and installed in the home and people were injured as a result of that, then there's a more plausible case that the um, company could be responsible. So if you have any more questions, go ahead and type them in, please. Um, I appreciate you know you taking the time to participate if you have live here today. Otherwise, this will be recorded. Um, yeah, thanks, Julie, for the comment about the caricature. We, you know, the serious subjects and everything, but we you know, try to have a little bit of fun and you know, enjoy life while we're doing this uh, employment law and human resources stuff, right? So 
So again, the um, people who registered and attended the webinar will get a link to the live replay um, of this, and you should have access to the slides. If you have any follow-up questions, here's my contact information. You can give me a call or email me and see if I can point you in the right direction. Of course, this just uh, scratches the surface on numerous topics that would relate to telecommuting. Couldn't possibly address every concern that everyone might have in this setting, but hopefully it gave you some things to think about, either um, you know, additional areas to address with employees you have telecommuting or some um, guidance that might now enable you to allow more employees to telecommute where there's a good business case for doing so. So I'm going to stay here for another minute or two if there are any more questions, and then otherwise we will close this up. Okay, so I'm not seeing any more questions, but again, based on the answers to the polls that I put up, it sounds like um, many people do have employees telecommuting within their organizations, and they have many more employees who would probably like to telecommute. Um, again, I'm not here to tell anybody whether they should or shouldn't allow anyone in particular to telecommute, except to the extent that the law may or may not require it, um, but I hope you have receive some information that will be valuable in making those decisions and addressing concerns that may relate to employees working remotely. So again, this is Scott Horton with Horton Law. Thanks for attending the webinar on the law of telecommuting.